from Carl Jung's The Effects of the Con Unconscious Upon Consciousness, Chapter 1, The Personal and Collective Unconscious. In Freud's view, as most people know, the contents of the unconscious are limited to infantile tendencies which are repressed because of their incompatible character. Repression is a process that begins early in early childhood under the moral influence of the environment and lasts throughout life. Through analysis, the repressions are removed and the repressed wishes made conscious. According to this theory, the unconscious contains only those parts of the personality which could just as well be conscious and are in fact suppressed only through upbringing. Although, from one point of view, the infantile tendencies of the unconscious are the most co conspicuous, it would nevertheless be incorrect to define or evaluate the unconscious entirely in these terms. The unconscious has still another side to it. It includes not only repressed contents, but also all psychic material that lies below the threshold of consciousness. It is impossible to explain the subliminal nature of all this material on the principle of repression. Otherwise, through the removal of repressions, a person would acquire a phenomenal memory which would thenceforth forget nothing. We therefore emphatically say that in addition to the repressed material, the unconscious contains all those psychic components that have fallen below the threshold including subliminal sense perceptions. Moreover, we know from abundant experience as well as for theoretical reasons that the unconscious also con contains components that have yet not, not yet reached the threshold of consciousness. There, these are the seeds of future conscious contents. Equally, equally we have reason to suppose that the unconscious is never at rest in the sense of being inactive, but is continually engaged in grouping or in regrouping its contents. Only in pathological cases can this activity be regarded as completely autonomous. Normally, it is coordinated with the conscious mind in a compensatory relationship. It is to be assumed that all these contents are personal insofar as they are acquired through the individual's life. Since this life is limited, the number of acquired contents in the unconscious mind must also be limited. This being so, it might be thought possible to empty the unconscious either by analysis or by making a complete inventory of unconscious contents on the ground that the unconscious cannot produce anything more than is already known and accepted in the conscious mind. We should also have to infer, as already indicated, that if one could stop the descent of the conscious contents into the unconscious by doing away with repression, unconscious productivity would be paralyzed. This is possible only to a very limited extent, as we know from experience. We urge our patients to hold fast to repressed contents that have been reassociated with consciousness and to assimilate them into their plan of life. By this procedure, we may daily convince ourselves making make, by this procedure, as we may daily convince ourselves, may, I'm sorry, but this procedure, as we may daily convince ourselves, makes no impression on the unconscious, since it calmly continues to produce dreams and fantasies which, according to Freud's original theory, must arise from personal repressions. If in such cases we pursue our observations systematically and without prejudice, we shall find material which, although similar in form to the previous personal contents, yet seems to contain illusions that go far beyond the personal sphere. Casting about in my mind for an example to illustrate what I have just said, I have a particularly vivid memory of a woman patient with a mild hysterical neurosis, which, as we expressed it in those days, had its principal cause in a quote-unquote father complex. By this, we wanted to denote the fact that the patient's peculiar relationship to her father stood in her way. She had been on very good terms with her father, who had since died. It was a relationship chiefly of feeling. In such cases, it is usually the intellectual function that is developed, and this later becomes the bridge to the world. Accordingly, our patient became a study of, psych of philosophy.
Her energetic pursuit of knowledge was motivated by her need to extricate herself from the emotional entanglement with her father. This operation may succeed if her feelings can find an outlet on the new intellectual level, perhaps in the formation of an emotional tie with a suitable person, equivalent to the former tie. In this particular case, however, the transition refused to take place because the patient's feelings remained in suspended, oscillating between her father and a man who was not altogether suitable. The progress of her life was thus held up, and that inner disunity so characteristic of a neurosis promptly made its appearance. The so-called normal person would probably be able to break the emotional bond in one or the other direction by a powerful act of will, or else, and this is perhaps the more usual thing, they would come through the, diffi through the difficulty unconsciously, on the smooth path of instinct without ever being aware of a sort of conflict that lay between their headaches or other physical discomfort that lay behind their headaches or physical discomforts but any weakness of instinct which may have been many causes is enough to hinder a smooth unconscious transition then all progress is delayed by conflict and the resulting stasis of life is equivalent to a neurosis in consequence of the standstill, psychic energy flows off in every conceivable direction, apparently quite uselessly. For instance, there are excessive innervations of the sympathetic, sympathetic system, which lead to nervous disorders of the stomach and intestines or the vagus, and consequently the heart, is stimulated, or fantasies and memories, uninteresting enough in themselves, become overvalued and prey on the conscious mind. Mountains out of molehills. In this state, a new motive is needed to put an end to the morbid suspension. Nature herself paves the way for this unconsciously and indirectly through the phenomenon of transference. See Freud. In the course of treatment, the patient transfers the father imago to the doctor, thus making him, in a sense, the father, and in the, in the sense that he is not the father, also making him a substitute for the per man she cannot reach. The doctor, therefore, becomes father and a kind of lover, in other words, the object of conflict. In him, the opposites are united, and for this reason he stands for a quasi-ideal solution of the conflict. Without in the least wishing it, he draws upon himself an overvaluation that is almost incredible to the outsider, for to the patient he seems like a savior or a god. This way of speaking is not altogether so laughable, laughable as it sounds. It is indeed a bit much to be a father and a lover at once. Nobody could possibly stand up to it in the long run, precisely because it is too much of a good thing. One would have to be a demigod, or at least to sustain such a role without a break, for all the time one would have to look to be the giver. To the patient in the state of transference, this provisional solution naturally seems ideal, but only at first, and in the end she comes to a standstill that is just as bad as the, neur as the neurotic conflict was. Fundamentally, nothing has yet happened that might lead to a real solution. The conflict has nearly been, merely been transferred. Nevertheless, a successful transference can, at least temporarily, cause the whole neurosis to just disappear, and for this reason it has been very rightly recognized by Freud as a healing factor of first-rate importance, but at the same time as a provisional state only, for although it holds out the possibility of a cure, it is far from being the cure itself. This somewhat lengthy discussion seemed to me essentially if my example was to be understood, for my patient had arrived at the state of transference and had already reached the upper limit where the standstill begins to make itself disagreeable. The question now arose, what next? I had, of course, become the complete savior, and the thought of having to give me up was not only exceedingly distasteful to the patient, but positively terrifying. In such a situation, quote, sound common sense, unquote, gradually, generally comes out with a whole repertory of admonitions. You simply must, you really ought, you just cannot, etc. So far as sound common sense is, happily, not, non, not too rare and not entirely without effect, pessimists I know exist, a rational motive can, in the exuberant feeling of health you get from transference, release so much enthusiasm that a painful sacrifice can be risked with a mighty effort of will. 
if successful, and these things sometimes are, the sacrifice bears blessed fruit, and the erstwhile patient leaps at one bound onto the state of being practically cured. The doctor is generally so delighted that he fails to tackle the theoretical difficulties connected with this little miracle. If the leap does not succeed, and it did not succeed with my patient, one is then faced with the problem of severing this transference. Here, psychoanalytic theory shrouds itself in a thick darkness. Apparently, we are to fall back on some nebulous trust in fate. Somehow or other, the matter will settle itself. Quote, the transference stops automatically when the patient runs out of money, unquote, as a slightly cynical colleague once remarked to me. Or the ineluctable demands of life make it impossible for the patient to linger on in the transference. Demands which compel the involuntary sacrifice sometimes with a more or less complete rel relapse as a result. One may look in vain for accounts of such cases in the books that sing the praises of psychoanalysis. To be sure, there are hopeless cases where nothing helps, but there are also cases that do not get stuck and do not inevitably lead, leave the transference situation with bitter hearts and sore heads. I told myself at this juncture with my patient that there must be a clear and respectable way out of the impasse. My patient had long since run out of money, if indeed she ever possessed any, but I was curious to know what means nature would devise for a satisfactory way out of the transference deadlock. Since I never imagined that I was blessed with that, quote, sound common sense, which always knows exactly what to do in every tan tangible situation, and since my patient knew as little as I, I suggested to her that we could at least keep an eye out open for any movements coming from a sphere of the psyche, uncontaminated by our superior wisdom and our conscious plannings. This meant first and foremost her dreams. Dreams contain images and thought associations which we do not create with conscious intent. They arise spontaneously without our assistance and are representatives of a psychic activity withdrawn from our arbitrary will. Therefore, the dream is, properly speaking, a highly objective natural product of the psyche, from which we might expect indications or at least hints about certain basic trends in the psychic process. Now, since the psychic process, like any other life process, is not just a causal sequence, but it is also a process with a teleological orientation, we might expect dreams to give us certain indica certain indications indications about the object causality as well as about the objective tendencies because they are nothing less than the self-portraits of the psychic life process. On the basis of these reflections, that, reflections then, we subjected the dreams to a careful examination. It would lead too far to quote word for word all the dreams that now followed, let it suffice to sketch their main character, the majority referred to the person of the doctor, that is to say, the actors were unmistakably the dreamer herself and her doctor. The latter, however, seldom appear in his natural shape, but was generally disordered in a remarkable way. Sometimes his figure was of supernatural size, sometimes he seemed to be an extremely aged, and then again he resembled her father, but was at the same time curiously woven into nature, as in the following dream. Her father, who in, re was, who in reality was of small stature, was standing with her on a hill that was covered with wheat fields. She was quite tiny beside him, and he seemed to her like a giant. He lifted her up from the ground and held her in his arms like a little child. The wind swept over the wheat fields, and as the wheat swayed in the wind, he rocked her in his arms. From this dream, and from others like it, I could discern various things. Above all, I got the impression that her unconscious was holding unshakably to the idea of my being the father-lover, so that the fatal tie we were trying to undo appeared to be doubly strengthened. Moreover, one could hardly avoid seeing that the unconscious placed a special emphasis on the supernatural, almost divine nature of the father-lover, thus accentuating still further the overvaluation occasioned by the transference. I therefore asked myself whether the patient had still not understood the wholly fantastic character of a transference, 
or whether perhaps the unconscious could never be reached by the understanding at all, but must blindly and, I and idiotically pursue some nonsensical chimera. Freud's idea of the unconscious can do nothing but wish. Schopenhauer's blind and aimless will, the Gnostic demiurge who in his vain vanity deems himself perfect, and then in, his, in the blindness of his limitation creates something lamentably imperfect, all these pessimistic sus suspicions of an essentially negative background to the world and the soul came threateningly near. And indeed, there would be nothing to set against this except a well-meaning you ought reinforced by a stroke of the axe that would cut down the whole phantasmagoria for good and all. But, I, but as I turned the dreams over and over in my mind, there dawned on me another possibility. I said to myself, it cannot be denied that the dreams contain, continue to speak in the same old metaphors with which our conversations have made both the doctor and the patient sickeningly, sickeningly familiar. But the patient has an undoubted understanding of her transference fantasy. She knows that I appear to her as a semi-divine father lover, and she can at least intellectually distinguish this from my factual reality. Therefore, the dreams are obviously reiterating the conscious standpoints minus the conscious criticism, which they completely ignore. They reiterate the conscious contents, but not in toto, in they, but insist on the fantastic standpoint as opposed to the quote-unquote sound common sense. I naturally asked myself what was the source of this obstinacy and what was its purpose. That it must have some purpose of meaning, I was convinced, for there is no truly living thing that does not have a final meaning, and that can, in other words, be explained as a mere leftover from antecedent facts. But the energy of the transference is so strong that it gives one the impression of a vital instinct. That being so, what is the purpose of such fantasies? A careful examination and analysis of the dreams, especially of the one just quoted, revealed a very marked tendency in contrast to conscious criticism, which always seems seeks to reduce things to human proportions. To endow so a very marked tendency to endow the person of the doctor with his superhuman attributes. He had been had to be gigantic, primordial, hung huger than the father, like the wind that sweeps over the earth. Was he then to be made into a god? Or, I said to myself, was it rather the case that the unconscious was trying to create a god out of the person of the doctor, as if it were to free a vision of god from the veils of the personal, so that the transference to the person of the doctor was no more than a misunderstanding on the part of the conscious mind, a stupid trick played by quote-unquote sound common sense? Was the urge of the unconscious perhaps only apparently reaching out towards the person, but in a deeper sense towards God? Could the longing for God be a passion welling up from our darkest instinctual nature, a passion unswayed by any outside influence deeper and stronger perhaps than the love for a human person? Or was it perhaps the highest and truest meaning of that inappropriate love we call transference, a little bit of real Gotsmini, that has been lost to consciousness ever since the 15th century. No one will doubt the reality of a passionate longing for a human person, but that a fragment of religious psychology and a historical anachronism, indeed something of a medieval curiosity, we are reminded of Metzstild of Magdeburg. Should so should come this we are reminded that something indeed something of a medi medieval curiosity should come to light as an immediate living reality in the middle of a consulting room and be expressed in the prosaic figure of the doctor seems almost too fantastic to be taken seriously a genuinely scientific attitude must be unprejudiced. The sole criterion for the validity of a hypo hypothesis is whether or not it possesses a heuristic, i.e. explanatory, value. The question now is, can we regard the possibilities set forth above as a valid hypothesis? There is no a priori reason why it should not be just as possible that the unconscious tendencies 
have a goal beyond the human person, as that the unconscious can, quote-unquote, do nothing but wish. Experience alone can decide which is the more suitable hypothesis. This new hypothesis was not entirely plausible to my very critical patient. The, very, the earlier view that I was the father lover and as, such was, and as such presented an ideal solution of the conflict was incomparably more attractive to her, in, to her way of the feeling. Nevertheless, her intellect was sufficiently clear to appreciate the theoretical possibility of the new hypothesis. Meanwhile, the dreams continued to, to disintegrate the person of the doctor and swell them into ever vaster proportions. Concurrently with this, there now occurred something which first I alone perceived and, with the utmost astonishment, namely, a kind of subterranean undermining of the transference. Her relations with a certain friend deepened per perceptibly, notwithstanding the fact that unconsciously she still clung to the transference. So that when the time came for leaving me, it was no catastrophe but a perfectly reasonable parting. I had the privilege of being the only witness during the process of severance. I saw how the transport, transport personal control point developed. I cannot call it anything else. A guiding function, step by step, gathering to itself all the former personal overvaluations. How, with this afflux of energy, it gained influence over the resisting conscious mind without the patient's consciously noticing what was happening. From this I realized that the dreams were not just fantasies, but were self-representations of unconscious developments which allowed the psyche of the patient gradually to grow out of the pointless personal tie. This change took place, as I showed, through the unconscious development of a transpersonal control point, a virtual goal, as it were, that expressed itself symbolically in the form which can only be described as a vision of God. The dream swelled the human person of the doctors to superhuman proportions, making him a gigantic primordial father who is, at the same time, the wind, and in whose protecting arms the dreamer rests like an infant. If we try to make the, patient's consci the patient conscious and traditionally Christian idea of God responsible for the divine image in the dreams, we would still have to lay stress on the disproportion. In religious matters, the patient had a critical and agnostic attitude, and her idea of a possible deity had long since passed into the realm of the inconceivable, had dwindled into a complete abstraction. In contrast to this, the god image of the dreams corresponded to the archaic conception of a natural demon, something like Wotan. Theostope Pneuma, God is Spirit, is here translated back into its original form, where Pneuma means wind. God is the wind, stronger and mightier than man, an invisible breath spirit, and, as in the Hebrew Ruark, so was Arabic Hura, meaning breath and spirit. Out of the purely personal form, the dream developed an archaic God image that is infinitely far from the conscious idea of God. It might be objected that this is simply an infantile image, a childhood memory. I would have no quarrel with this assumption if we were dealing with an old man sitting on a golden throne in heaven. But there is no trace of any sentimentality of that kind. Instead, we have a primitive conception that can correspond only to an archaic mem me mentality. These primitive conceptions, of which I have given a large number of examples in my Symbols of Transformation, tempt one to make, in regard to unconscious material, a distinction very different from that between the pre-conscious and the unconscious, or subconscious and unconscious. So, between pre-conscious and subconscious, or between subconscious and unconscious. The justifications for these distinctions need not be discussed here. They have a definite value and are worth refining further as points of view. The fundamental distinction which experience has forced upon me merely claims that the value of a further point of view, the value of a further point of view. From what has been said, it is clear that we have to distinguish in the unconscious a layer which we may call the personal unconscious.
the materials contained in this layer are of a personal nature insofar as they have the character partly of acquisitions derived from the individual's life and partly of psychological factors that could just as well be conscious. It is readily understandable that incompatible psychological elements are liable to repression and therefore become unconscious. But, on the other hand, we also have the possibility of making and keeping the repressed contents conscious once they have been recognized. We recognize them with, as personal contents because we can discover their effects or their partial manifestations or their specific origin in our personal past. They are the integral components of the personality. They belong to its inventory and their losses, their loss to conscious pro produces an inferiority in one or another or the other respect, an inferiority, moreover, that has a psychological character, not so much of an organic mutation, mutilation or an inborn defect as of a want which gives rise to a feeling of moral resentment. The sense of moral inferiority always indicates that the missing element is something which one feels should not be missing, but which could be made conscious if only one looked took enough trouble. The feeling of moral inferiority does not come from a, uh, from a collision with a generally acceptable and, in a sense, arbitrary moral law, but from the conflict with one's own self, which, for reasons of psychic equilibrium, demands that the deficit be, readdressed, be redressed. Whenever a sense of moral inferiority appears, it shows that there is not only the demand to assimilate an unconscious component, but also the possibility of assimilating it. In the last resort, it is a person's moral qualities which force them, either through direct recognition of the necessity to do so or indirectly through a painful neurosis, to assimilate their unconscious self and keep themselves fully conscious. Whoever progresses along this road of realizing the unconscious self must inevitably bring into consciousness the contents of the personal unconscious, thus widening the scope of their personality. I should add at once that this widening primarily concerns the moral consciousness, one's self-knowledge, for the unconscious contents that are released and brought into consciousness by analysis are usually unpleasant which is precisely why these wishes, memories, tendencies, plans, etc. were repressed. There are the contents that are brought to light in much the same way by a thorough confession, though to a much more limited extent. The rest comes out as a rule in a dream analysis. It is often very interesting to watch how the dreams fetch up the essential points bit by bit and with the nicest choices. The, most, the total material that is added to consciousness causes a considerable widening of the horizon, a deepening self-knowledge which, more than anything else, is calculated to humanize a person and make th that person modest. But even self-knowledge, assumed by all wise people to do, be the best and most effic efficacious, has different effects on different characters. We make very remarkable discoveries in this respect in practical analysis, but I shall deal with this question in the next chapter. As my example of the archaic idea of God shows, the unconscious seems to contain other things besides personal acquisitions and belongings. My patient was quite unconscious of the derivation of, of, of spirit from wind, or of the parallelism between the two. This content was not the product of her thinking, nor had she ever thought of it. No, nor had she ever been taught it. The critical passage in the New Testament was inaccessible to her. To pneuma pnai hopai thilai, since she knew no Greek. If we must take it as a wholly personal acquisition, it might might be caught be a case of so called cryptomnesia. cryptomnesia. Uh, footnote: Flory Daisy Day à la planète. Planète Mars étude sur une case de somnambulisme avec uh, Glossladi. So, okay, end of footnote. The unconscious re recollection of a thought which the dreamer had once read somewhere. I have nothing against such a possibility in this particular case, but I have seen a sufficient number of the other cases.
many of them are to be found in the book mentioned above, where cryptomnesia can be excluded with certainty. Even if it were a case of cryptomnesia, which seems to me very improbable, we should still have to explain what the predisposition that was caused that just that the predisposition that caused just this image to be retained and later, as Simon put it, ecfortated. So, ecforine Latin effere to produce. In any case, cryptomnesia or no cryptomnesia, we are dealing with a genuine and thoroughly primitive god image that grew up in the unconscious of a civilized person and produced a living effect, the effect which might well give the psychologic of religion food for reflection. There is nothing about this image that can be called personal. It is a wholly collective image, the ethnic origin of which has long been known to us. Here is a historical image of worldwide distribution that has come into existence again through a natural psychic function. This is not so very surprising since my patient was born into the world with, with a human brain which presumably still functions today as much as, much as it did of old. We are dealing with a, rea with a reactivated archetype as I have elsewhere called these primordial images. Footnote, so psychological types, collected works, volume six, end footnote. These ancient images are restored to life by the primitive analogical mode of thinking peculiar to dreams. It is not a question of inherited ideas, but of inherited thought patterns. Footnote, consequently, the accusation of fanciful mysticism leveled at my ideas is lacking in foundation. End footnote. In view of these facts, we must assume that the unconscious contains not only personal, but also impersonal collective components in the form of inherited categories or archetypes. I have therefore advanced the hypothesis that at a deeper level, at deeper levels, the unconscious possesses collective contents in a relatively active state. This, that is why I speak of the un collective unconscious. End of reader of reading of this chapter. Now, um, readers, um, readers' um, thoughts on this. So I was interested in reading this, and I'm also re in reading other aspects of the collective unconscious and to learn more about the collective shadow in light of the election outcome here in, um, in 2016, where it seems like we've elected, you know, somebody who's not a, not a, uh, you know, he's not, he's not the establishment, that's for sure, but he also seems to have a personality that is representative of um, or maybe represents a, a a real shadow side of of humans with you know being pretty saying pretty strongly sexist things about women and um, things about Muslims. It's like this aspect of the of all of us, and so where it's really easy and there's lots of division that's happening now in our nation at um, right before Thanksgiving, in 2016. It's, so it's just really easy to say it's them, and I'm sure they are saying it's them to this side of them, if you know what I mean. I think the real question here is to really be looking at what is the collective unconscious. And I know that Jung talks about that there's a balancing. So if you have the sort of the evil collective unconscious or a destructive force, sort of a Kali goddess, and in the in the Indian terms, or a um, young called talked about Wotan as the collective unconscious of the sort of Nazi, you know, the destructive, you know, the destructive god that god image that rose up in the in Germans preceding Hitler. That young believes that there can be a balancing. Um, but I think that that balancing really requires quote-unquote analysis or discussion or bringing things into light and, and seeing seeing things as they are, seeing things as they truly are. So um, I'm very interested in, in what that looks like. Hopefully we can learn from our past and, and um, 
and, and come to a balanced place. So I'll continue just to read some other things about this in this segment. So I want to read something from a website called the cgyoungpage.org and the, it's an essay called Young's Shadow, Two Troubling Essays by Young and it's written by Per K. Brask, B-R-A-S-K. Young was, in 1936, trying to figure out what was happening in Germany. The results of his considerations he put down in an essay called Wotan, in which he tried to understand the German situation by means of the mytho mythology around the German god Odan, a.k.a. Wotan. Quote, in therapies that promise to put a person back in touch with an authentic self, the person is enjoined to try to tap these powers, this inside of nature, to dig deeply into the subjectivity of his, their organism. The theory is that as one progressively peels away the social facade, the character defenses, the, unco the unconscious anxiety, that person then gets down to their real self, the source of vitality and creativity behind the neurotic shield of character. In order to make psychology a complete belief system, all the therapist has to do is to borrow words for inner depths of personality from mystical religions. It can be called ver ver various, variously the great void, the inner room of Taoism, the real essence, the source of things, the it, the creative unconscious, or whatever. Ernest Becker, The Denial of Death. Young was, in 1936, trying to figure out what was happening in Germany. The results of, so I'll start over again. The results of his considerations were put down in an essay called Wotan, in which he tried to understand the German situation by means of the mythology around the German god Odin, a.k.a. Wotan. We have seen him, quote, we have seen him come to life in the German youth movement and right at the beginning of the, of the blood of several sheep was shed in honor of her resurrection. Armed with a rucksack and loot, blood, blonde youth, and sometimes girls as well, were to be seen as restless wanderers on every road from the North Cape to Sicily, faithless, faithful votaries of the roving god. Later, towards the end of the Weimar Republic, the wandering role was taken over by thousands of un unemployed who were to be met with everywhere on their aimless journey. By 1933, they wandered no longer, but marched in their hundreds of thousands. The Hitler movement literally brought the whole of Germany to its feet. From five-year-olds five year to veterans and produced the spectacle of a nation migrating from one place to another. Wotan the Wanderer was on the move. Who is this Wotan? He is the god of storm and frenzy, the unleasher of passions and the lust for battle. Moreover, he is a superlative magician and artist in illusion who is versed in all secrets of an occult nature. Wotan disappeared when his oaks fell and appeared again when the Christian god proved too weak to save Christendom from the fratricidical slaughter. Fratricidical slaughter. I venture the, herard, the her, heretical suggestion that the unfathomable depths of Wotan, Wotan's character explain more of the northern of national socialism than all economic, political, or psychological factors put together. The gods are without doubt personifications of psychic forces, and when one is in, is possessed by such a god, there is not much one can do about it. And in the case of Wotan, we're talking about a fundamental attribute of the German psyche. Because the behavior of a race takes on its specific character from its underlying images, we can speak of an archetype Wotan as an autonomous psychic factor. Wotan produces effects in the collective life of a people and thereby reveals his own nature. But we must remember, cautions Jung, that it has always been terrible to fall into the hands of a living God. Yahweh was no exception to this rule, and the Philistines, Edomites, Amorites, and the rest who are outside the Yahweh experience most certainly have found it exceedingly disagreeable. The Semitic experience of Allah was for a long time extremely painful affair for the whole of Christendom. We who stand outside judge the Germans far too much if they were responsible agents, 
but perhaps I would be near the truth to regard them as victims. It would undoubtedly be terrible to fall into the hands of a living God, if such a thing were possible, but the, equally young, but e the equality Young proposes between Yahweh and Wotan is bizarre. Now, he's now these are the end of the quotes from, we're starting from the author. So, so the, the, is bizarre. The Germans were not in the process of receiving messages of moral and religious law from Wotan. They were in the process of submitting their personal autonomies to Hitler as their Fuhrer. One hopes, evidently against hope, that Jung did not intend the equalization as an argument of redemption for the Germans. Because if he did mean this, he might as well have said outright that Wotan made them do it, as the Jews were only getting what they gave the Phil Philistines and the Edomites and the Amorites. So what right do they have to complain? A rather chilling statement for Young to make the year after the Nuremberg Logs had been declared. Norse mythology is filled with stories about people being possessed by animals, about people going berserk. Hitler enjoined being a wolf, Adolf being a derivation of the old German word for wolf, and the whole German nation seemingly just went berserk. But if this kind of possession is so autonomous, so out of everyone's control, so sweepingly racial, Racial, then how does one explain all those people who didn't join in, who weren't swept away in a tidal wave of Germanic frenzy? A lot of Germanic countries did not go into the craze. Perhaps the only explanation would be that they were not really Germanic, and that this, and that this, the Nazis, and maybe the Swiss German, then, and, and, and with this, the Nazis, and maybe the Swiss German young would agree. Either you were possessed or you are not a real German. Your national or racial roots were suspected. Your instincts, that is, your subconscious, did not have the proper tracks for an autonomous Wotan to run on. The limitations of this view of human psyche seem glaring. Even so, I would like, before pointing out its equally glaring dangers, to quote Oterank's observations on Jung's fundamental mistake. Quote, his early experience with psychologic types whose main characteristic is their complete withdrawal from reality and the building up of an inner world of their own led him to believe that the individual's fundamental problem lies in the feeling of isolation regardless of what his environment may be. Consequently, he did not look for individual salvation in his relation to reality either through rebellion or submission, but a sublimation of those inner forces which were frustrated. In this psychological process of sublimation, the individual, according to Young, makes use of the symbolism of his racial unconsciousness, thus achieving, as it were, a kind of collective, kind of collectivity with its own self. Such a striving towards an almost mystical union between the self and its racial background is supposed to link the isolated individual with a bigger whole of which he can feel a part. End of quote. In other words, as far as Odo Rank is concerned, the process of being an individual person in young psycholo psychology undervalues a person's choices in relation to the world in favor of sublimating frustration, i.e., young put the world into the person's unconscious, whereas Freud had put it into the person's superego for him or her to make peace with it, as it were, solip. I don't know what that word is. Jung was not, of course, alone in considering the racial wellsprings of the human personality. For further evidence of the Volkish roots of Jung's philosophy, see Richard Knoll's The Young Cult. And in particular, the figure of Wotan. Alfred Rosenberg, Hitler's chief ideologist, seemed to be in agreement with Jung in the following quotes. Quote, soul means race viewed from within, and vice versa is the externalization of the soul, end of quote. Quote, a life feeling both young and, so young, like young and old, and yet known in ancient times is pressing towards articulation. Quote, the life of a race does not represent a logically developed philosophy, nor even the unfolding of a pattern according to natural law, but rather the development of a mystical synthesis, an activity of soul which cannot be explained rationally, nor can it be conceived through a study of cause and effect. More quotes. Once again, there, down, there dawned an age where the Fenris wolf broke his chains when hell, ex exuding the odor of decay, moved over the earth and the Midgard serpent stirred the oceans of the world. End quote. Wagner understood, quote, that the Nordic soul is not contemplative and that it does not lose itself in individual psychology, but that it willfully experiences cosmic spiritual laws and is architecturally, architect, 
iconically constructed. This inner beauty idea is developed in Wotan, end quote. Thus, on the matter of the Germanic psyche, Rosenberg and Young both mystify in the same manner the notion of the self by attaching it to the mythologies which somehow express a race-based will through the individual that happened to have a certain ancestry. In other words, the people of this ancestry have a race will that when it will inevitably override the possible individual choices. Such a construction of the self differs substantially from the existential explanations uh, the existential experience, sorry, of an individual sensing the strange dizziness or the angst of Ki 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 Kierkegaard, as, or the angst, as Kierkegaard put it, associated with the realization that the I of the self is radically unstable. This was an insight Kierkegaard may well have learned to frame from reading his neighbor and idol Paul Martin Muller's novella and Dansk students and Event Theater, The Adventures of a Danish Student. In this novella appears a philosophically minded student who becomes utterly paralyzed from the vertigo entailed in keeping track of all of his eyes. The existential experience may lead to the conclusion that there is no solid self of any kind in the human psyche, that there is an ego, a will that negotiates and chooses under given circumstances to promote the to promote the survival of the organism from a singular and relative perspective is clear or experience would not be possible what is what in the question what is in the question is how much is included in the given circumstances and the manner in which they delimit delimit the ego's progress as it were it seems to me that young is willing to extend these circumstances far back into some nebulously conceived human your situ situation and furthermore he is willing to make them so determinate by some Lamarckian biological process I suppose that he loses sight of the individual's experience of choice and at least relative autonomy to my to my mind he undermines the very process of ego creation the coming to terms or not between the world and singular will in 1946, Ryang wrote another essay called After the Catastrophe. Quote, Before the work of reconstruction be can begin, he said, he wrote, there is a good deal of clearing up to be done, and this calls above all for reflection. Now, reflection could take place, end of quote. Now, reflection could take, pla to take place a task that has been impeded while being possessed by an archetype. Quote, while I was working on this article, I noticed how churned up one still is in one's own psyche and how difficult it is to reach anything approaching a moderate and relatively calm point of view in the midst of one's emotions. No doubt we should be cold-blooded and superior, but we are, on the whole, much more deeply involved in the recent events in Germany than we like to admit. Who is that? End of quote. Who is that we? A good many intellectuals who had fought against the Nazis, had no reason to admit anything of the kind. Why did Young? Before encountering these, encountering these two essays, I was puzzled by my inability to find some evidence of vociferous protest against Young, uh, uh, sorry, vociferous protest from Young against the rise of the Nazis in Germany. I was puzzled because I had admired a good deal of his work and the work of many who were and are his followers, and so I had expected to find his whole hearted protest recorded somewhere. Upon encountering the first essay, I had to accept that Young's basic outlook in some way in some way prevented him from objecting because he was too fascinated with watching the possession he had invented. I won't say his outlooks necessarily prevented him, because I don't believe that such necessities apply. After all, in his choice of archetypes, he could easily have emphasized the matter in which the Germanic people, in overvaluing Wotan's warrior features, had, say, undervalued the feminine qualities of Frigg or Freya, as well as Wotan's own more creative aspects, and whence had become the unbalanced as a nation. If using one's god as metaphor possession, then why not in the context of the rest of the pantheon of Nordic gods? In the second essay, an attempt at contribution is the second es essay an attempt at contribution oh sorry is the second essay an attempt at contrition on young's part he does say that he found um he, he found himself steering his ship between S Scylla and Ch Cherubus, stop stopping his ears to one side and of his being and lashing 
the other to the mass, thus mixing up two different stories. Staring between Sela and Cherubus has nothing to do with tying yourself to the mask and blocking your ears to the song of the sirens, but it is an interesting image of Young steering his ship, yet being tied up. He admits that he was, effect that he was affected by the sirens, quote, the inner identity or per participation mystique with the events in Germany has caused me to experience afresh how painfully wide is the scope of the psychological concept of collective guilt, unquote. But Young's guilt is not personal, it is collective. Was this not that what they all said in various ways at Nuremberg? The entire European civilization persis participates in the guilt. Young feels, quote, even a saint would have to pray unceasingly for the souls of Hitler and Himmler, the Gestapo and the SS, in order to repair the damage to his own soul. The sight of evil kindles evil in the soul. The victim is not the only sufferer, end quote. Far from explaining Nazism as a mystical collective possession to Wotan in 1936, Young in 1946 moved on to proposing the need for a mystical possession of guilt. In one possession, the victim got what was coming to them, and in the next, the perpetrators are suffered as well as their victims. This all sounds as much as obfuscation, uh, exp uh, explanations that produce even greater challenges to understanding. Why curiously, while curiously absolving individuals involved in horrendous crimes because of a massive hysteria. Thus, Jung set a context in which making an appeal to following orders can be acceptable as sufficient explanation. Jung's philosophy, his outlook, his insights, his brilliance did not immunize, immunize him from proto-fascist thinking. Even in the view of Jung's analyst and scholar Andrew Samuels, Jung was, at the very least, misguided when he published on various racial psychologies, quote, containing generalizations about Jewish culture and psychology, end quote. Indeed, they may have caused his misguided inaction. Immunization against a particular form of oblivion may depend on a philosophy which includes individual agency and responsibility in its purview, that is, on a psychology which resists a deterministic view of human behavior. In fact, one could argue from the historical record that even though under the presidency of the Germ General Medical Society of Psych for Psychology, he did make it possible for Jewish analysts to continue their work by establishing an individual membership category. Young was so intent on keeping his form of psych psychotherapy alive over that of Freud's that he even talked of Freud's son, of Freud as a Jewish psych psychology, and he must have known what that implied at the time. And by allowing well-known Nazi psychotherapists to use his name and his ideas because they were, after all, members of the largest and most powerful contingent of the society. When Young became president of the society in June 1921, 1933, he selected and declared Nazi sympathizer Gustav Richard Heyer as his vice president. So, when it mattered for people, and especially for intellectual leaders, to take a stand in 1933-39, to 39, his voice was not heard among the protests, which I suppose is marginally better than Heidegger, who joined the party and imposed the, imposed the first Führer rule on a German university. The, the, notion, the notion of a collective unconscious may be useful as a metaphor for hinting at some of the common experience we share by the simple fact that we are all human. I do not recognize, this is the author, I do not recognize that humans at times conform to patterns of behavior as if some cultural default setting. As well, human descriptions of those patterns may themselves follow certain culturally based patterns such as shaping of stories into beginnings, middles, and ends, but collective racial possession? Young's basic mistake, if I can put it like that, may have been that he tended to see individuals as a kind of merging with or raising of the collective unconscious, casting, as it were, the per human personality in terms of a demigod. By so doing, he arguably overlooked the ex ex existential dimension of experience from which people strive to make meaning through choices related to, as Rank would have it, the ontological positioning of the human, being at one and the same time propelled by the desire to merge with something larger, to overcome isolation and the urge for individuation through the creation of unique personality. Fascism is one day one way. Among um, fascism is, is one way among many of seeming to overcome the ontological tension by lurking 
luring the individual into merging with a unique stake, a unique heritage, or simply unique interests. But it is a struggle with the ontological contradiction that people may discover even larger and more dynamic playing field. Archetypes as metaphors may be useful um, as educational tools in the recognition of, say, literary patterns. That is, they are, cultural pro they are a cultural product which may have some explanatory power or when applied to other cultural products as a framing device, in other words. But this does not mean that they carry some biological determination in them for ourselves. For in the end, there, for in the end, there may be a self in the sense that storied me. There may be only by a choosing self, th there may only be a choosing self-awareness or a relative perspective organized in an organism that helps to keep it alive in the wider sense of the term. This choosing self-awareness needs tools which, with which to navigate the world in which it is a part, and one such tool is the notion of archetypes. Another tool is existential psychology, which I have used to frame the present reading of Jung. This psychology, of course, has its own limitations, which will not be addressed here. Suffice to say that I clearly choose it for two reasons that I'm aware of, and for several others for sure, of which I'm unaware of. The first is that it suits my intellectual temp temperament, and the second is that it throws a glaring light on the limitations of Jung's explanations of Nazism as the fateful rising of an archetype. However limiting or expansive a, psychology, a psychology may be, in order to promote to promote the greatest spectrum of psychological health for the largest number of individuals, it must at some basic level see individuals as persons, persons who are responsible and who have rights, and as such they are accountable and they might must be sustained in their individual bodies and souls. This basic level must not be overlooked in any talk or collectivity, whether conscious or unconscious, especially when the language of mythology is evoked to suggest individual or common experiences. A line must be drawn before individual choice is explained away and personhood is drowned in a rising tide of archetypal fate. So that's the end of the essay. Reader's commentary on the essay. So I, I do agree with the writer that, about that there is no excuse for a young um, to not have stood made, made a stand from my understanding of his role, which is scant. Um, and at the same time, um, it's very interesting to look at what he's saying, what Young is saying about possession. So I'll say that when, um, you know, this is early days of the election outcome for, for um, Trump, but you know, I have my own personal background of um, having a Jewish um, blood, and part of that, when Trump was elected, was uh, you know, with all of the talk of anti-Muslims, was well, where does it go next? Of course, it would go to the Jews, and I have my own personal story that came up and caused me a lot of uh, heartfelt anxiety that I hadn't felt to the degree before in my life. A story in my of my um, grandmother taking my father and her her other son. So my uncle, out of Paris on a truck, first time she had ever driven, and um, she got a flat tire as she was leaving Paris. She had a boat; they were going to go to England, and she got a flat tire. And a German a Nazi uh, came and 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 fixed the car for her. And he told her, "Madame, um, the French don't need to fear the Germans coming in. You know, you French have nothing to fear, but but the but the Jews." And he made the sign of, of cutting somebody's throat. Of course, he couldn't tell that she was Jewish. Um, she was terrified, and she went back to Paris, and she did eventually manage to leave Paris with her two little boys. Um, everybody else in the family was killed, except my grandfather, who spent the war in a, in a camp, and then one uncle who, who literally jumped out of a cattle car. So there's this... Um, you know, there's this, whether it's epigenetic or, or if it's part of a archetype or if it's learned, I think that that's all mixed together. These, these parts of us that are, um, they're very deep.
and then when we get to a place of stress, they come up. And it feels like in this country that we've kind of gotten there. And it seems to me like we do have in America, we have archetypes, and one of them is the sort of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, the reverse Robin Hood. And we seem to epitomize this this idea of somebody who's really wealthy and their wealth justifies them because that is the virtue. And it's just so interesting. I haven't flushed it all out in my own mind of how it is that we elect somebody who is extremely wealthy and um, you know is the representation of that reverse Robin Hood, whatever that archetype is, in to be anti-establishment, which is... Um, something has seized us and it would it seems to me that it would do us very well to pick this apart to look at this in terms of of um what are those those archetypes that are in us what are those those gods that we've created in america that we are um i believe that we are seeking for i think that young does have that right that we have this desire in us that's whether it's in like the archetype of the wheat god or whatever it is, we have a deep desire to to believe in something bigger than ourselves. And I think that the president of the United States is in a way kind of our, you know, whoever gets to be there, that's the pinnacle. That is kind of our our representation of a of a god. So it seems like there's a lot to think about here for me at least for me. I'm very interested in, in reading and learning and thinking about this more. I'll read one last piece for this little bit. This is an essay by Michael Gellert called The Eruption of the Shadow in Nazi Germany. And this article, published in the Psychological Perspective, issue 37, 1998, was originally delivered as a lecture to the C.G. Young Institute of Los Angeles in 1997 and is dedicated to the memory of Bobby Yeo. So I'm going to read this essay. There is an old joke about the division of labor in, in heaven and hell. In heaven, we are told, the English are police, the French are chefs, the German are the engineers, the Swiss are the bankers, the Italians are the lovers, the Russians are the ballet dancers, and the Japanese are in charge of electronic media and technology. In hell, the Eng English are the chefs, the Italians are the bakers, bankers, the Germans are the police, the Russians are in charge of the media and propaganda, and the Japanese are the ballet dancers, and the Swiss are the lovers. Jokes of this kind, when they are based not, barely, not merely on crude and cruel stereotypes, derive their humor from what we all know to be true about different nations. We know that every nation or ethnic group seems to have a distinct temperament, with unique qualities, talents, and predispositions. The term most commonly, commonly used to describe this sort of collective identity is national character. Yet nobody knows what national character is. Is it genetic or is it acquired? Is it a fixed thing or does it change over time? Does it exist in the psyche or is it purely social phenomenon? Um, what is it rooted in? Climate, geography, historical events? It was probably such questions that prompted the historians Jacques Barzin to observe that, quote, of all the books that no one can write about those about nations and national characters are the most impossible. End quote. Certainly national character is one of the vaguest and most mysterious nations in the, in the history of nations. It was the predecessor, predecessor to a host of ideas that attempted to fathom what it is that makes a nation unique. David Hume's writings about national character in the 18th century stressed that moral backbone is the factor most responsible for, na for a nation's climate. Voltaire, by contrast, contrast, spoke of the subtle spirit that constitutes the genius of the people, quote-unquote. And then there was the much-touted ideas of Heg Hegel, the notion of Wolfgeist, which died an infamous death when the Nazis took hold of it, along with Nietzsche's Superman idea, and twisted it to suit their nationalistic purposes. But, in its origi original form, it remains a potent idea that indirectly led to Freud and Young's thoughts on the subject. 
Volksgeist literally means people's spirit and refers to the inner life of a people. This idea suggests that every nation has a very real spirit force with ontological status and that it is this that produces a nation's culture and identity. Volksgeist is a cousin of Zeitgeist or spirit of the times. Both are manifestations of Volksgeist or world spirits. The latter is a living entity and moving force behind the human history. By the early part of the 20th century, Volkgeist had come to mean a common ego that is a singular collective mind. But this is only a short leap to Freud, who applied his theories of individual psychology to a collective psychology. In Totem and Tattoo, in Totem and Taboo, he acknowledged the existence of a collective mind in which mental processes occur just as they do in the mind of an individual. Freud believed that this collective mind is essentially a dangerous, unruly force that tends to exhibit a mob mentality because it operates according to the lowest common denominator. In group psychology and the analysis of the ego, he proposed that the cultural refinement, cult civilization, and moral integrity that may exist among individuals are reduced in the masses to a baser level of instincts that commonly binds us together. Young's view of the collective psyche, the section. Young very much agreed with Freud on this point and expressed in his essay, quote, the phenomena resulting from the assimilation of the unconscious. Both men had lived through the First World War and had seen the rise of Nazi Germany. And both were inoculated with a healthy dose of pessimism in regard to what human beings are capable of when they fall prey to the impulses of mass consciousness. Where Young departed from Freud was with his formation of different levels of the conscious of the collective psyche. First, there is a level of the collective consciousness consisting of all consciously held values, belief systems, information, and knowledge that together form an identity's, uh, sorry, a society's identity. For example, our society's belief in institutions of democracy, its commercial practices, its religions, its media, its sense of its own history, all constitute what we know about ourselves. This level is really readily accessible to all. Beneath this level is the collective unconscious, itself divided into two layers. The first contains the basic character traits of the group. These include national and racial characteristics of temperament, basis, basic ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. The joke I told above speaks of, to this layer of collective unconscious. Some of these features are inherited, others are in the cultural milieu, and simply absorbed by the individuals exposed to them. Yet all are collective traits that are acquired unconsciously, and needless to say, a group may be quite unconscious of its subtler character traits because they are all pervasive. As Marshall McLuhan said, a fish is the last to know that it is in the water. The second and deeper layer of the collective unconscious is a universal layer. It is like a storehouse or, or, or memory of the many experiences that all humanity has. These experiences are etched into the collective unconscious, not by any actual experien experimental way, but as blueprints or models that are un the underlying forms or patterns of these experiences. Jung called these psychic blueprints archetypes because they are primarily or generally types of experiences and are not specific experiences. If we dream of a snake biting us, for example, our dream is, in addition to whatever personal meaning it may have, a variation of an archetype or universal experience that stretches back eons in history. The archetype of the serpent, serpent has been depicted in countless folk tales and religious stories, as well as the story of Adam and Eve. When we dream of this archetype image, it evokes a hidden level of meaning and emotions. Indeed, the strange terror and yet fascination may lead us, let, may and yet fascination many of us feel when we see a snake can be attributed to a deep archetypal feeling this image arouses to the deep archetypal feeling this image arouses. The collective unconscious is of course full of archetypal images and motifs like that of the serpent. The role of the collective unconscious in collective behavior, and particularly the behavior of nations, is not easy to determine. Yet, as Young voiced in 1939 in a 1939 interview, quote, there is such a force as the collective unconscious of a nation, unquote. The two layers of the collective unconscious here merge to create a distinct national disposition and mode of experience. Unlike the Volksgeist of the German philosophers, the collective unconscious of a nation moves beneath the collective consciousness of its citizens. Similar to the parts of an individual personality, 
that are the unconscious, so is the unconscious part of a people's spirit. It may be said that the three-layer division of the psyche in the individual, the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious is paralleled in collective psychology by a collective conscious, the group layer of collective unconscious, and the archetypal layer of the collective unconscious. And just as the unconscious parts of an individual's personality infants his or her identity, the inherent character traits and archetypal forces of a nation's collective unconscious influence its identity. The archetypes affecting one nation can be quite varied and can differ significantly from those affecting another nation. In a nation's collective unconscious, the wide range of possibilities of a universal collective unconscious is narrowed down to those that tend to be particularly active for the nation. To examine these forces is like looking into the hidden soul of a nation, if one can speak of a nation in this way. The example with, with which Young best illustrated how the national unconscious might manifest is, as one could possibly guess, Nazi Germany. As a Swiss German who lived through both world wars, he could barely have been unaffected by what was going on just next door, next door to his country and all around on the European continent, but I imagine that his real interest in this phenomenon, as in, in the case of other psychologists who wrote about it, was in the fact that it was such an irrational and unprecedented extreme in human behavior. Never before or since has there been such a collective atrocity. Nazi, Nazi Germany exhibited par excellence what can happen when the de demonic forces of the collective unconscious are, whoops, are unleashed. Jung's efforts as a pioneer in psychology were generally more inclined towards emphasizing the wisdom of the unconscious. However, his interest in the darker side of the unconscious was, he would have argued, no less in the service of wisdom, for to entertain one side without the other would be foolish. Human nature is complicated, and, as the adage goes, what we don't let in the front door sneaks around and breaks in through the back door. One can say this is exactly what happened in the case of the German people. How could a nation, which was one of the leaders of the Enlightenment only a couple of centuries earlier, descend into such darkness as that, when, what, as that which created the Holocaust? The question is not purely a historical one that applies only to Germany 50 years ago. It is also a psychological one that applies to us now, here in America and in the rest of the world. It is a question about the human condition. For if what happened to a people like the Germans, whose genes and genius produced not only Hitler, but Goethe, Kant, Kepler, Mozart, and, Schip and, and Schweitzer, to mention only a few, what does this say about the rest of us? Hopefully Americans will never become as militant, fanatical, and inhumane as the Germans became, though through, though, as this nation's treatment of indigenous people and Af African slaves indicates, it too is quite susceptible to the demonic side of the unconscious. The plain fact is, Americans can be quite violent and cruel. Section Collective Complexes What the German case illustrates is that collective complexes can become all-consuming and can have massively destructive consequences. In some regards, the formation of a collective complex is not so much different from that of an individual complex. The term complex was first coined by Theodore Zai Han to describe emotionally loaded representations or ideas. Jung used it to denote contents of the unconscious that are split off from the, from the consciousness. The concept became so central to his thinking that for years he referred to his emerging school of psychology as complex psychology. Up until Jung used the term in this way, Freud spoke of complexes as circles of thoughts, quote unquote, or quote, traumatic reminiscences, quote unquote. Adler also borrowed the term for his purposes and made it a household word with his concept of the inferiority complex. Everybody is familiar with this notion, and certainly it relates to our subject. A person feels inferior but may not know it, since the feeling can be repressed into the unconscious. It can also be projected outside onto others so that the person compensates by becoming, in his or her own mind, superior, perhaps even persecuting others so that they so that for what now has become their inferiority, further bolstering a much-needed sense of adequacy. But the true feeling of inferiority, inferiority is never seen by the individual for what it is, for it is a part of the psyche that has been split off from the consciousness. Others might more easily detect that this individual has a problem of feeling inferior, but the person in question would never guess it. Such a set of unconscious dynamics is basically what is meant by a complex. 
that it can never occur, I'm sorry, that it can occur in the collective psyche only goes to show that a complex can work on multiple levels so that an entire mass of people can be gripped by the same complex. The most common explanation put forth for the rise of Nazism is that the Germans were gripped by a collective inferiority complex. They had lost the First World War, were humiliated by punitive Versailles Treaty, and were suffering under oppressive conditions of unemployment and poverty during the Depression. These were the seeds that gave birth to the Third Reich. In a 1938 interview, however, Young placed the original source of the German inferiority complex far earlier than this, cen than this century, attributing it to when the Germans emerged from the D Danube Valley and found the beginnings of their nation, because this initial consolidation took long, a long place after the French and English were well on their way to nat nationhood, the Germans were too late in the acquisition of colonies and in the establishment of an empire. When they did finally become a united nation, Young said, quote, they looked around them and saw the British and the French and others with rich colonies and all the equipped, equipped, they were, became jealous, resentful, and like, um, and like brothers have taken the lion's share of the inheritance. This is a something missing in my quote. Um, in Childhood and Society, Eric Erickson said to these explanations by added to these explanations by connecting the rise of Nazism to the German sense of being oppressed by a loth, aloof but harshly authoritarian father. This could only contribute to an inferiority complex that was, if Young were right, already deep seated. The reactions to this sense of, up of oppression had the basic features of adolescent rebellion, and some of these were more extreme than others. Self-aggrandization, lofty idealism, delirious passion, megalomania, rage, and violence. Hitler's personal history, as Erickson showed, captured the conflicts of this rebellion in quintessential form, and thus did his struggle and his hysterionic pleas for a new political order resonate so deeply in the souls of the German people. Young saw the German inferiority complex as rooted in the basic character and temperament of German people, and thus a complex of the group layer of the un collective unconscious. However, this was not all that Young saw. He also discovered an archetypal complex acting upon the goth German psyche. As a complex of the universal layer of the collective unconscious, it adds another dimension to the question of what happened to the German people. Of course, no complex can satisfactory explain the evil of a war that took the lives of 6 million Jews, 27 million Russians, and millions of others, or that made possible the horrors that were perpetuated on the, in the death camps. Evil of this kind is so awesome that it defies clarification, but understanding archetypal complexes can shed some light on such evil, for these complexes come from the same inner dimension as do good and evil. The, quote, problem of evil, unquote, as theologians call it, is also an archetypal experience as old as the human condition. It is no accident that the Bi Bible begins and ends with it. Young basically understood archetype complexes to be inner persons of our psyche. Many, if not most, of the people who populate our dreams represent our complexes. The fact that they may be people who we know in our daily lives is often of significance only for the associations they provide, or because these people carry the projections of these complexes and thus become symbols for them. But the complexes themselves are primarily inner phenomena. In our dream, these people often act in ways and say things that they would never do in our daily lives, and, of course, we have no control over what they say or do. They are independent forces with wills and voices of their own. Their attitudes, their ideas, attitudes, and atmosphere they bring into our dreams come from another realm and are so out of this world that we are often imbued with a mysterious feeling and moods long after we are awakened. We have awakened. Such a cluster of ideas, attributes, and affects is what Jung called a complex. He showed that behind the people who personify these clusters are the archetypes. They are presented as people so that we can recognize and relate to them, and they also appear as a multitude of magical beings who inhabit our dreams. Supernatural heroes and villains, angels and demons, witches and nymphs, talking animals, monsters, and so forth. Jung viewed these figures as autonomous agents of the archetypal imagination, um, originating in the collective unconscious and existing in their own right with distinct personalities.
Thus, such complexes are also part of the psyche that are split off from, unco from consciousness. But unlike the complexes that Freud and Alder spoke about, they do not originate in either individuality or collective consciousness. How does this apply to collective psychology, and in particular Nazi Germany, in an essay called Wotan, which was written as early as 1936, Jung identified the archetypal Wotan, Wotan complex of the German people. Life and Times of Wotan and Other Gods Wotan is a god in the early form of a person like the Greek and Roman gods, and the chief deity of the early German Teutonic tribes. He is the same being as the Viking god Odin, for the Vikings were also descendants from the two Teutons. He shared much in common with Dionysus and was transformed by the Christian missionaries into the devil. In Memories, Dreams, and Reflection, Young wrote, quote, He is an important god, a Mercury or Hermes, as the Romans correctly realized, a nature spirit who returned to life again in the Merlin of the Grail legend and became, as the Spiritus Merca Mercurialis, the sought after Arcanon of the Alchemists. End of quote. Wotan is the god of art, culture, wisdom, hunting, war, and the dead. Of these, war is his favorite speciality. The root word wot means to be mentally excited and is connected with the German wot or rage. Wotan is the lord of warriors, seizing their spirits and making them go berserk in the heat of battle. He guides them to victory, and when they die, he receives them into Valhalla, the hall of the slain. In his 1936 essay on Wotan, Young describes him as, quote, the god of storm and frenzy, the unleasher of passions and the lust of battle. Moreover, he is a superlative magician and an artist in illusion who is versed in all secrets of the occult nature, unquote. Considering these attributes, Young could just as easily have been speaking about Hitler. The stormtroopers, too, were very much an incarnation of Wotan, who roamed the earth as a restless a wanderer, creating strife and unrest everywhere he went. His spirit of conquest and turbulence, Jung hypothesized, eventually seized the entire German nation. It is important here to appreciate the notion of a god and the challenge it poses to the modern mind. We do not know anymore what, is meant, what it means to have a god, to serve a god, to be inspired by a god, or for that matter, to be assaulted or seized by a god. We no longer have gods in the ancient traditional sense, and even from our familiar Judeo-Christian perspective, we no longer recognize the real forces implied in the first commandment, quote, thou shall have no other gods before me. But what were the gods, and what does their disappearance signify? Speaking of the Greek god Pan, James Hillman raises an interesting point that illustrates the nature of the gods. Hillman notes that when Pan appeared at his sacred noonday day hour in, or in a nightmare, he arose Great panic, indeed the word panic is derived from pan, but pan was not a symbolic representation or personification of the concept of pan, for, quote, he was seen to be in headlong panic himself. The person of pan was witnessed in the state of panic before the concept of panic was born, unquote. In other words, the Greek experience of panic was pan. Before panic came, became internalized psychological state, it was God. The sharp definition between the inner and the outer that results from a discursive discerning ego is a late development in the history of consciousness. The world was alive with the gods. Through the imagination, that is, the image-making facility, our more primitive emotions and instincts were experienced as very real images of the soul. After all, what could be more gut level, a gut level encounter with panic than the sight of a horned god, part human, part goat, stamping his hoofed feet and hysterically screaming as if he had just himself woke from a nightmare? Today we would call such an experience a projection, but in their day the gods were the living embodiment of the soul's innermost anxieties, fears, aspirations, and panics. The gods also embodied the terror of nature and, in this regard, were unlike the later gods in the Roman poet Lucretius Revered were unlike the later gods the Roman poet Lucretius revered when he wrote that the gods must, by their nature, take delight in peace, forever calm, serene, forever far from our affairs, beyond all pain, beyond all danger, in their own resources strong, having no need of us all, above wrath, appropriation. The modern poet Rilke had a more accurate picture when he said that in the gods, the, quote, deadly and menacing and destructive and terrifying elements in life were contained 
It's violence, it's fury, it's impersonal bewilderment, all tied together in one thick knot of malevolence, unquote. And how well he understood the enormous power of the gods, of the gods quote, since they were an overflow of our own being in its more powerful elephant, element, indeed, were too powerful, were huge, violent, incomprehensible, often monstrous. How could they not, concentrated in one place, exert an influence and ascendancy over us, and remember, from the outside now? End quote. The human psyche needed and one may argue still needs, the mythopoetic imagination to meditate these unbelievable and incomprehensible forces. It is easier to have a relation to a god than to an impersonal force. The gods carry our worst fears of the unknown. Indeed, they carried the unknown itself. By relating to the gods through homage and ritual, the ancients were able to relate to their own fears, thereby better enduring the mysterious forces of the unknown. In this way, the gods served humankind as well as the other way around. It was a mutual, if not equal, relationship. But without the gods, who will make the inner and outer terrors of life endurable and meaningful? Not only are the gods gone, but in the 20th century, God himself has disappeared, or at least he did in Germany. The trail of detachment, oh sorry, the trail of disenchantment began with the very enlightenment that made the Germans a people of great culture. The code of reason that propelled the Enlightenment may have explained the gods, but in doing so, also explained them away. The Romantic movement was more of a reaction to this than any real antidote to it. The rise of a rigid, one-sided nation, Young felt, meant that the primitive, irrational side of the psyche was repressed into the unconscious. It was only a matter of time before the reign of irrationality led to Nietzsche's claim that God is dead, and finally to the godless Germany. And, as Dostoevsky said, without God, anything is permissible. The primitive, irrational side was thus left no choice but to break in through the back door, and it did so with a vengeance. This trend of demythologization, ugh, to borrow a term from the theologian Rodolf Bolt, Boltmann, doesn't change the fact that whatever forces one conceives the gods to be, they still must exist. Hillman, modeling his thought upon Jung's, sees our modern symptoms of psychopathology, our phobias, obsessions, and other diseases, as the secular forms of God. If pan is gone, now we experience panic as a symbol within ourselves. However, our pathos or suffering is all caught up in the intricate web of our personal dramas, which we don't understand any better than our ancestors understood pan. In fact, we understand our suffering far less, since we no longer have a larger religious constant context in which to view it. Our panic no longer has cosmic significance. It is not existential panic to which the Greeks felt we as humans were entitled. It is only neurotic pain for which we modern, from which modern psychology tells us we're sick. In sacrificing the gods, we have lost a valuable, well-trodden path to redemption, to reconnection of the soul with its natural and spiritual roots. This is what D.H. Lawrence meant when he said that the only thing more terrible than to fall into the hands of a living god was to fall out of them. The same is true for any living god. The Wotan complex is the spirit of the depersonalized or demythologized god Wotan manifesting in the collective psyche of the German people. Without the person and the myth of the god to identify and mediate its force, Wotan appeared invisibly from within as a disease of the mind and soul. His true identity remained concealed in the annals of history and in the collective unconscious. Even Nietzsche, who is unfamiliar with Germanic literature, as Jung pointed out, misconstrued the identity of Wotan. On different occasions, he called him Zarathustra, Dionysus, the mystical wind, and simply the unknown god. In his essay, Wotan, Jung cites Nietzsche's poem to the unknown god, quoting, I shall and will know the unknown one who searches out the depths of my soul and blowest through my life like a storm, ungraspable, and yet my kinsman, I shall and will know thee and serve thee, end quote. And speaking most prophetically from the point of view of our Zarathustra, Nietzsche exhorts, quote, Like a wind shall I come blow, to blow among them, and with my spirit shall take away the breath of their spirit, and thus my future wills it, end quote. At least Nietzsche knew he was worshipping a god, an autonomous force. The German people, half a century later, were unconscious of this. Their spirit was indeed overtaken by Wotan's.
It was with Wotan's self-empowering qualities that Nietzsche was so impressed. Jung also recognized the positive aspects of this god, for he appeared to reanimate the depressed spirit of the Germans. This accounts for Jung's initial hopes in the very early days of the Nazi movement that it might turn into something positive, a view he quickly abandoned when he saw the negative effects this god was having upon the German society. Even well before Hitler's arrival on the scene, Jung suspected that the German psyche was headed for a catastrophe based on his clinical work, the German patients, particularly in his dream, their dreams. In early eight, 1918, in his essay, quote, The Role of the Unconscious, he warned about the blonde beast menacingly, quote, prowling about in its underground prison, ready at any moment to burst out with devastating consequences. At end quote. At times, Jung wax negative about the Wotan impulse, at other times hopeful and optimistic. <clears throat> Until events demonstrated otherwise, he remained ambivalent and in accord with the dual nature of the archetype. He did not wish to similar, summarily dismiss either side of Wotan. Remember, Wotan is not only a god of hunting, war, and death, but of art, culture, and wisdom. He inspires divinity as well as demonic, demonically. Here we come to an important premise that every archetype has two sides, positive light and negative dark. Actually, there are neutral attributes, like the constructive and deconstructive side of nature. Their intent is neither good nor evil. Rather, it is the human experience of them that is either positive or negative. In the practice of psychotherapy, Young notes that the positive side of the archetype is experienced as superhuman, spiritual, and divine. The dark side is bestial, semi-human, and demonic. The former represents our higher nature, the latter our lower or primitive nature. Quote, and the further the conscious situation moves away from a central point of equilibrium. End quote. Young writes, quote, the more forceful and accordingly the more dangerous becomes the unconscious context that are struggling to restore the balance, end quote. Again, Young cites the example of the movement towards rigid one-sided rationalism as creating a disequilibrium that eventually set the stage free for the primitive instinctual side of Wotan to rise up in a compensatory manner. However, this only partially explains why the demonic side of Wotan won out over the divine side, why the god of war was constellated and not the god of art and culture. There are two other reasons. Historical content of Wotan and the German um, and the German's collective psyche. The first reason has to do with the history of Christianity in Germany. John Young explains that Christianity came rather late to Germany compared to other European countries and consequently had never penetrated deeply enough into the German psyche to assimilate the different elements of the Wotan myth. The Reformation also emerged from Germany for this reason, Catholicism simply did not have a stronghold in the mythos of the people. The Wotan myth went underground, that is, receded into the collective unconscious, but with the weakening of Christianity that occurred in the 19th and 20th centuries due to the rise of rationalism, broke out again in an unrecognized form of it at the first opportunity. Walter Odajnik writes that what in fact occurred was a regression on the part of the masses to a more primitive German consciousness um, to a time when Wotan and not the Christian God ruled. The regression was destructive precisely because of the people's unconscious of it were unconscious of the complex. In civilization and transition, Young warns, if an arch quote, if an archetype is not brought into reality consciously, there is no guarantee whatever that it will be realized in its favor favorable for form. On the contrary, there is all the more danger of a destructive regression. End quote. It should be added that Christianity was introduced into Germany like a thunderclap with the invasion of Charlemagne. It may be that the forcible entry of Christianity into the Germanic, Germanic psyche distributed, disturbed the former balance of the positive and dark sides of Wotanism. Apart from Wotanism, the role of Christianity in the rise of anti-Semiticism in Germany as elsewhere cannot be dismissed. Indeed, the earliest records of anti-Semiticism in German date from around 1060, some 300 years after the Frank invasion. In the 15th century, Martin Luther was so offended when the Jews did not accept his offer for salvation through baptism that he vilified them in the treatise The Life of the Jew. The Nazi publisher Julius Streicher used this as a basis for his defense at the Nuremberg trials. And of course, it is well known that the Vatican did little to deter the spread of anti-Semitic acts in Nazi Germany. The other reason the dark side of Wotan was constellated involves the collective inferiority complex. 
if a feeling of inferiority or of having been spited looms over a people, a god of war and retribution is likelier to be more appealing than a god of art and culture. It is a human nature, and particularly collective human nature, to opt for quick and dramatic results to ameliorate a bad situation. The events in Nazi Germany illustrated a nation possessed by a collective complex. This possession has, was a psychic inflation, an excessive identification with the god who is at the core of the complex, because the god could not be seen or experienced as a god, the identification occurred entirely on an internal and unconscious level. Because the high suggestibility and infectiousness that exists among the masses, this possessed state of mind spread like wildfire. Young described it, describes it as a psychic epidemic and a mass hysteria psychosis. Being caused by a collective complex, it struck the Germans at the collective level of the psyche rather than the individual level beneath the ego and the individual personality. In their book, The Nuremberg Mind, Florence Miley and Michael Sel Selzer commented on the enigma of how the German leaders seemed to be such ordinary, well-intentioned people. It was a social collective context that their values and behaviors became warped beyond recognition. This is how a collective complex works. Individuals are but stepping stones for its design and purpose. The neutral nature of archetypes. It needs to be said that the kind of pathology we are talking about does not originate in the collective unconscious, or at least the archetypal nature of the collective unconscious. Jung asserts that the collective unconscious does, have, does not have a pathology. The archetypes are forces of nature and the spirit incapable of being sick in and of themselves. Oh, the archetypes are forces of nature and, and the spirit, incapable of being sick in and of themselves. Furthermore, they are two-sided and thus balanced. The pathology arises from collective consciousness, or a group layer of the collective unconscious, or both. Both these layers of the collective psyche are conditioned by a nation's experience and not immune to pathological twists. When an archetype emerges from the collective unconscious and interfaces with some disturbances in the collective consciousness or the group layer of the collective unconscious, it gets filtered, so to speak, through the disturbance. This both constellates the dark aspects of the archetype and draws the disturbances into the sphere of the archetype. One may think of the complex as a bubble of air released from a fissure at the bottom of the ocean, gathered unto itself other, gathering unto itself other particu particles of air contents of the upper layers and the collective psyche as it rises. This is what happened when the Wotan complex, it acquired and was filtered through features of collective experience in Germany, including the nation's inf inferiority complex, its one-sided rationalism, and its diminishing relationship to Christianity. The problem of evil. This, there is a widely held view derived from the Enlightenment, that evil is only ignorance or woundedness coming out in a pathological form. That is, that evil is primi, pr, privatio bono, the absence of good. But anybody who has a direct confrontation with willful evil, either in him or herself or in others, knows that it exists as a real force or principle in the psyche. Our Western religious, tra religious traditions have always posited evil as a metaphysical force, Young's provocative essay, Answer to Job, attempted to address this age-old problem. What does it mean that God allowed evil to exist? Does this not imply that God himself was, had a dark or evil side? There is much to suggest this in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. As early as Abram's encounter with God, in which he bargains with him to spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if even ten righteous people live there, we see that God needs to be held accountable. Quote, shall not the judge of all earth do right, Abram pleads with his maker. In other words, not only does man need God for redemption, but God needs humans for his redemption. A mutual partnership brings moral wholeness to both. Jung argues that there is an unconscious side to God and there are, as there is to humans, and that both parties need each other to attain a more complete consciousness. Whatever it is, the principle of evil cannot be denied. We see it historically in the Crusades, in the Inquisition, in the purges and the pogroms, in the world wars, in all the lesser wars, and then and now we see it in the crimes of our time, in the demonic actions of Jeffrey Dahmer, in the Oklahoma City bombings, in the O.J. Simpson episode, in the news every night. Evil needs to be recognized in each and every one of us, 
we each need to see it clearly within ourselves instead of projecting it onto the other person or a group of people or conveniently onto the devil who supposedly made us do it. As Mick Jagger sings in his song, Sympathy for the Devil, quote, I shouted out who killed the Kennedys when after all it was you and me. Indeed, end of quote. Indeed, that force which traditional religion has always called the devil might have made us do it for an e for evil is not only a given principle it is an autonomous principle with a life and will of its own yet in the end it is we who do it who consent to it con consciously or unconsciously it is only consciousness that helps us in our battle with evil this is a battle that should be aimed not so much against evil in an effort to make it disappear as if it ever could but rather at keeping it in view and understanding how it operates. In this way, we become aware of our own impulses without being dominated or overtaken by them. This is a battle that must take place within the individual soul. A nation can only be conscious and moral as its individual citizens. One of my patients had given me permission to share an active imagination, a vision she had in her struggle to come to terms with the problem of evil in her life. It illustrates the idea that one must accept the existence of evil and learn to live with it consciously. It also illustrates how the god Wotan surf surfaces in modern times as an incarnation of evil precisely because he is split off from his other side. The patient is a Catholic-born American woman in her, early, in her late 30s. She entered analysis in a state of severe depression, which she connected to her experience as having been sexually molested by her father when she was a child. In addition to suffering from symptoms of obsessiveness and self-mutilation, she was plagued by an overwhelming conviction that God must hate her and is punishing her. Her active imagination, or vision, occurred at a turning point in her treatment. In it, her father appears as a Viking holding a sword in his hand. He says he hates her because he hates all women, his mother, his grandmother, for what they did to him. He then tries to cut his daughter's throat. She is not afraid and does not resist. But neither does she, emo she emotionally submit. You cannot win, she says simply. At this moment, a globe of radiant white light like the sun emerges from behind him. She intuitively perceives this light to be emanating from a compassionate, loving God, whom she recognizes as the real, real authority here. She is bathed in the light, and the vision ended. Reflecting upon it, she said that this was her first experience of God as a positive force. As in any dream or visionary experience, one could look at everything in it as part of oneself. The Viking father with sword in hand as it came to the dark father complex or Wotan complex. The radiant globe of light is a symbol of the higher self, the God within. These are not parts of the personal psyche, but the objective or archetypal psyche, though they are, of course, filtered through the personal psyche and one's lived experience. Together they make up the dark and light sides of the self or the God image. For this patient, bringing them into relationship with each other and with the ego began the long process of healing the deep wound and split in her psyche. The archetypal, the archetypal shadow, the dark self aspect of the self, is always a tricky problem. Firstly, we tend to take it personally, as the patient did, but it's not personal. It's intrinsic to the human condition. Secondly, we tend to unconsciously confuse it with the positive aspect of the self. An equal sign is placed between good and evil, and then, of course, all hell breaks loose. Does anybody doubt that Hitler or Timothy McVeigh were not acting with a firm belief that they were serving a good and higher purpose? It was no accident that not long after her visionary experience, this patient, who had no immediate connection to either German or Jewish traditions, had a powerful dream which took place at Auschwitz. She witnessed a young couple being burned to death by the Nazis. Whenever the dark Wotan complex or Nazi shadow comes up in a matter that is all-consuming, it is signaling some kind of profound split or confusion in the psyche. In such a condition, everything can go up in flames, and quite literally often does. When we ponder all the recent outbreaks in the world that contain elements of the Holocaust travesty, this is what we see. Most often the perpetrators are unconscious evil. They believe they are doing good. But this is how evil operates. As Charlie Heckney put it, or Henke put it, the devil does not come up to your door looking like the devil. He is, in a he is dressed in a tuxedo, holds a bouquet of flowers, and has a friendly, inviting smile. Only when we, as individuals, can bear to look in the mirror and see that part of ourselves, 
can we begin to truly fathom and manage the evil in the world? And that's the end of the lecture by Michael Gellert. Here's commentary. So I'm continuing with the theme of um, the post-election sort of emotional crisis that's happening in our country and in individuals with the extreme um, divi divisiveness. There's just so much, such a great divide now, I think, um, in terms of people in the city, people in rural communities, people rich and poor. The, the divide is all kinds of different ways. And there's this cry for um, change. Um, and, you know, I like Young's quote, you know, what you resist persists. So I'm hoping that, that our nation will get that change um, in a positive way and that we will have some balance and see things in a balanced way. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on, because I really do believe what, what Gellert says about that it really you really do have to look at it at an individual piece, that you can't like take a nation to psycho psychoanalysis, but to look in myself and to look at, you know, the, the parts of me that are, um, that I am capable, I myself am capable of being, as my, um, my teacher would say, that with the right conditions, Anybody, any one of us could have ended up being X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z, whatever that evil person is or doing that evil thing. And, and to try to really see that. And from that, to be able to then hold those two conflicting pieces, right? The, 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 the good and the evil, to really hold those and hope and pray that from that comes... Um, and trust, I should say, not hope and pray, but really trust that from that comes um, the transcendent. So I, I do hope that for us, and um, we shall see. <laughs>